read t from Taylor that he asked me to read to the crowd. So it says, Dear Mel, if you have the opportunity, please reply, uh, relay this message to my friends at Bungleheads 10. My first visit to the Vanguard campus was during our second Boglehead reunion in June 2001. I will never forget the thrill of meeting and listening to Mr. Bogle and meeting face to face with individual <laughs> forum Bogleheads whom I had come to know and respect. It's an honor for all of us to be part of Mr. Bogle's great crusade to give ordinary investors a fair shake. Savor the moment. I know that someday each of you will look back on this occasion as three of the most memorable days of your life. Best wishes, Taylor. And now this is a, a special part of the program that, we, that started probably five or six years ago, and we call it the Fireside Chat. And there's nothing organized about it. Bill and uh, uh, Jack are going to ramble in any fashion, talk about any subject they want, just about any subject. <laughs> That's an inside joke. So anyway, I'll get out of the way and I'll turn it over to Bill and Jack. Okay, well, I'm going to start off with uh, just a, a real, real softball here for Jack, which is, it has to do with the fact that a lot of you folks are, are coming here for the first time, something like 40% of the people are coming here for the first time. And, and I think it would be worthwhile for, for those people to hear, it's always a story that you know you and you've heard before. It's worth hearing again of how the Bogleheads uh, and Jack got together and, and, and how it, it more or less got started from Jack's perspective. It was, I guess, ten or eleven years ago, and when I was speaking at a conference in Florida, and this wonderful gentleman came up and chatted with me, and that turned out to be Taylor Larimer, and we talked about this and that. We got acquainted, and I gave a, a speech that was so angered the. Uh, uh, investment salesman that were at this conference, that the guy running the conference walked off the head table. <laughs> <laughs> and all I was doing was telling him the truth. <laughs> in any event, with that as the beginning, and we struck up a, a wonderful friendship, and I got to know his, his wife, lovely wife, Pat, and uh, it became greater and greater than we had. I was speaking down in Florida then again another year, I think a year later, and uh, he said, well, why don't we get the Bogleheads that are down there at this, maybe somebody's uh, conference, and we'll all get together. So I come down, the, get off the elevator, and there is a sign saying, as it was called then, Vanguard Diehards, meet here. And I thought, wow, this is getting a little out of hand. <laughs> so we went over to Taylor's lovely condominium over on Biscayne Bay and just had a nice evening together. I think there were about 15 of us, I can't remember, not huge. And uh, we just had a great time together. I typed out a little note to all the rest of the diehards, and uh, we went on from there, getting more and more formal each time. I should tell you, I think this is okay to tell you, that, uh, and this is very much related to it, uh, what went on at Vanguard last night was really, I thought, incredibly wonderful. They turned out uh, a wonderful group of people, mm -hmm. a fine panel, uh, uh, some of these guys, the guy that Rick Giannone, Giannone, who was, uh, uh, Giannone, who uh, runs our ETF mm -hmm. effort, our newly expanded ETF effort, uh, I went over to apologize to him for causing him so much trouble. <laughs> 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 and uh, he said, he basically, you're who we talk about all the time. You have the way of doing it right, and we want to do it that same right way. So I was very relieved by that. And I also said, how long have you been here, Rick? And he said, 20 years. <laughs> and I said, oh, Lordy, I just can't believe that you can be at Vanguard in, in, in 20 years, and I don't think I've ever met you before. I just hate that when it happens. I always talk to people on the lunch line and that sort of thing at the galley. And uh, you know, if there's a woman, I give them a kiss to make up for it. <laughs> he said, no, we did meet. He said, you, you talked to us on my first day here. <laughs> So uh, that was a nice part of it for me, and I know the guys that are doing the foundation. Uh, and I thought uh, Rebecca Katz, who used to be kind of a shy, introverted person, was the most wonderful MC. She was exuberant, and she's been a kind of a nice ally of mine for many, many years. Uh, but when the idea of Bogleheads, you get the diehards, came to Bogleheads, I guess, under the influence of Taylor and perhaps Mel, and uh, it, it was not in a, in a little difficult 
political time at Vanguard, it was not really all that uh, welcome a designation. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, and the very first time, this is a funny story, I think, uh, the very first time that you had a meeting in Valley 4, somebody's farm out there, do you remember that? Anybody remember that? Uh, and uh, the, uh, so the, I, I invited everybody over to Vanguard on a Saturday to spend a half a day in the office. And I was told, you wouldn't be allowed on the campus. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and an article appeared in the paper saying you were all coming to Philadelphia. And I was accused, they changed their mind quickly. And uh, I was accused of blackmail for planning the article, but I hadn't planted the article. But in any event, we, we then got to a more welcoming stage <laughs> last year. And not so good on the, the little things that mean a lot in these kind of meetings. So they stepped up their act last year, a nice little formal program with photographs, a whole lot of staff around there to help you out, and a wonderful panel. And I gather they gave you like little goodie bags or something like that. I don't know that, they didn't give me one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had, I had to leave early, I promised that you let me go for dinner by seven. And uh, we finally ate at eight, I think. Uh, but in any event, uh, it, it's, it's now you're really getting it Everybody loves to have you there. They put on a real show for, for you last night, and I was really immensely proud of all those people who were representing us out there, on, not only on the stage uh, and introducing our MC, of course, as I mentioned, uh, but also the people who had their little ETF booth and foundation booth and investment advisory and so on down the line. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's reached kind of a full fruition where you're really integral to this community, and you should have been all along. I mean, you represent who Vanguard is. We don't usually get 150 or 60 or 70, whatever it is, people in one place, the stockholders that are, are our basically mission in life. So it's just been a wonderful thing. And knowing Taylor from the very beginning is, was wonderful. I actually wrote him, I try and stay in touch with him a little bit. I never know exactly how his health is, but I wrote him about a week ago telling him how we, how we miss uh, seeing him here. And he, he wrote me back, I think it must have been the same day, or maybe it was just a coincidence that he wrote me at about that time. So uh, that was that was a beautiful part of the whole thing. So I very very much appreciate. I don't want to make this too long, Bill, but I so much appreciate uh, your uh, being with me and supporting me. And uh, when we're at Denver, I don't know how many of you remember Denver. I got you all invited to the Financial Analysts Federation uh, meetings. And the first question they asked me after I was speaking out there, and the first question they asked me is. Who are the Vogelheads? <laughs> How can I join them? <laughs> uh, so you're doing a great job for your fellow investors, and I'm just thrilled to be with you. And I, I'm sorry, by the way, I hope this mic is, I, I'm using it a little bit better than yesterday, I don't like those things. Uh, but in any event, uh, so it's onward and upward, and I'm proud to be part of you, and I never would have thought that my name, as it were, would be copyrighted. <laughs> Say the age equals bonds 
is a wonderful way to begin, a wonderful kind of framework for what you think, for the simple reason that when you're young, as was discussed a little bit yesterday, that when you're young, you depend on human capital for your wealth. And when you're older, you depend on investment capital for your wealth when you've retired. And uh, so the, the reality is that you've got to think a lot more about income when you're older. There's, a, when you mentioned, uh, Bill, is something about uh, five or six percent withdrawal rate, that's just, you know, almost no matter how old you are, uh, that's just excessive. And, and I'm starting to wonder a little bit whether in the environment that seems most likely uh, in the years ahead, uh, that uh, even four percent might be a little high, maybe three and a half percent. And there's risk in all this whenever you're taking money out. So you want to be very careful of it. That's the basis of it. There are, to me, no strategies that go beyond the basic public markets that give you the greatest chance of reaching your goals. But the public markets are things, as I mentioned in one of those late slides yesterday, the one thing you can't control is return. You can control time, you can control cost, you can control risk, but you can never control return. And so uh, I, I don't know what other options there, there are out there, in a way, I, and I, you know, I don't pride myself on my great consistency. I'm fairly consistent, but not, I don't think, uh, overbearingly so. But uh, even as I say, beware of, of reaching for yield, uh, I was telling you that you ought to think about reaching for a little yield, because if you're in the bond index, because the, the treasury bonds have some, so dominated the industry, the index, uh, that was not the case when the fund was formed way back in 1986. And uh, the yield is... Uh, Pathetic 2.3, not pathetic in this market, but not particularly attractive, would be fair, 2.3%. So I think you can go into corporates, which could give you as much as 4.5 or 5 investment grade corporates, according to the data. And uh, so we have to have, if you, it's pretty easy to do the math, they have to have a 2 or 3% default rate to get you down to the treasury level. And you make a judgment can the default rate be that high? The answer is, of course, it can. And what are the probabilities? Uh, that will be that high, I think very low, uh, and as, as always in Pascal's famous wager about the existence of God, uh, you've got to consider not only the probabilities but the consequences to you. Uh, another variation on this, and, and, and someone said maybe one of the Vogel heads, I'm not very consistent here because I say you want to take Social Security into account. Of course you want to take Social Security into account. Social Security, as long as it functions, which I think will honestly be a long time, and if it fails, you still are going to be getting 80% or something of what was promised. I don't expect that to happen. But uh, and you have a, a great inflation-proof bond portfolio that doesn't fluctuate in value and, and goes up pretty much year after year, even with a little bit of inflation. So if that's your bond account and you have, say, a typical Social Security account for someone around 65 has had a successful, reasonably successful at least working career, it could probably have a, a capitalized value of, I think the number's around $300,000, give or take. So if you're 100% in equities, you're 50-50. And that income stream, and this is really what we ought to be thinking about, you know, which there's so much that we've, I think, kind of lost sight of in this world. And as we look at total return, but what you spend was, what do you care about in effect about total return? This dividend income keeps going up and up and up and up and up, as it typically does every year. Although I quickly add, probabilities and consequences, that in 2008, the dividend yield in the S&P index went down, I believe it was 23%, something in that range. The largest decline, one of the three largest declines ever had in history. So you want to be very careful, but as long as the income comes along, when you're retired, that check comes in, the Social Security check comes in, and you shouldn't worry about capital fluctuations. So I don't, I don't see going outside of the, of the you know, publicly, public financial markets to try and do better. It's a little bit like if you're starting to lose, a little bit like you're going to the horse races and uh, you lose everything that you've got except 100 bucks or something um, through the first, I don't know how many races they had, let's say 11. So on the 12th race, the last race, uh, you take that $100 and bet it on a long shot to hope to recoup. That is not a good strategy. <laughs> so is that responsive? Yeah, uh, it, it, uh, I, I think it, it gets fairly deeply into the issue. What I'm thinking of uh, are people uh, like uh, Steve Bode, uh and Rob Arnott, uh, who've written long and hard, Mersh uh as well, 
uh, who say that really, you know, when you're retired, uh, conventional asset allocation goes out the window, and what you really ought to be looking at is defeasing uh, your living expenses. And so, you know, to my way of thinking, there are three things <coughs> that can do that. You've already mentioned one of them, Social Security, and, you know, you're, you're, you're right. The, the return on the, the, the public markets is not great. But the return on deferring your Social Security from 66 until 70 is 8% per year. Uh, so that's certainly one strategy. You know, that's got a problem, which is that the federal government could means test Social Security in the meantime and put you behind the eight ball. So there's a, there's a risk to that, even with Social Security. Uh, TIPS uh, are an excellent strategy, but then you have the risk that the federal government could rejigger uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the inflation formula, so there's still a risk there. And then finally, you know, you can get a, a, an inflation-adjusted variable annuity. The problem with those is twofold. Number one is the companies can go belly up. I wouldn't want to bet on the, the survival of any company in the current financial system, any insurance company. I, I <coughs> and in a systemic event, you know, the usual thing, the state guarantees, the state insurance funds would be a speed bump. Uh, <laughs> so that really doesn't help you. And then finally, the insurance riders that you buy with, with a lot of variable annuities uh, are really have some limitations. The one that Vanguard has, I think, has like a 3% inflation cap, which isn't going to do you a lot of good if we have hyperinflation. So, you know, I think what the rational person might do is to consider some combination of those three things uh, in, in, in retirement. And of course, you know, really, I, I guess the other issue is if you're someone a real bonehead and you wind up at age 70 with more money than you know what to do with and that you, and that you can possibly spend, which is a problem I think I'm afraid a lot of you are going to have, then, <laughs> then, 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 you have, then you have, you know, this large pile of assets on top of it, which really, you're not investing it for you, you're investing it for whoever your beneficiaries are, whether they're your relatives or charitable, or maybe you want to give the money to the government. <laughs> I, mean, I, I say that I, I, don't say, I don't say that in, I don't say that in jest. I, I, I don't mind paying taxes to the government. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, you know, the other comment I, I thought I would make is, you, you know, you threw out yesterday, Jack, uh, that that uh, really, you know. It's just professional money managers out there trading with other professional money managers who are just making the croupier, croupiers rich, which is certainly true. But I think there's something that's even more profound going on here is we have now reached the point where it's not people trading with other people. It's computers trading with other computers. Uh, there's a wonderful speech which, which is on, I think it's on YouTube, and it's on the American Financial Association, AFA, the American Financial Association. Uh, website, Ken French's 2008 presidential address, very understandable, um, in which he talks about this phenomenon. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've actually talked to him about this. I thought he would be reasonably sanguine about all the liquidity that's out there, uh, that it really improves things for passive investors, but he, he doesn't think that that's the case at all. I wonder if you have any comments on, on, on HF. Yeah, well, uh, that's actually an interesting subject, and I've argued with people like Cliff Asnes about it, who has a great hedge fund manager, who I have great respect, uh, and, uh, and other people. And in fact, uh, we've been I'm doing some work with a new book on the impact of high frequency trading. And uh, Michael got in touch. My assistant Michael Nolan got in touch with uh, uh, one of the guys that had written a big article about it, and I decided I would go see him and talk to him about it all. And I was I really want to get into down into the weeds see what's going on there. But for a long-term passive investor, I have to say, I don't think it matters. The trading is done at very low prices. It adds a lot of volatility in the market. But if you're truly a long-term investor and look at your statement every year, or even better, every 20 years, uh, <laughs> or even better, only when you retire, and I, I tell people that they, they would stop looking at their statements and just throw them in the ash can every year from age 21 when they start in their 401k until age 65, when most people retire, uh, they they would be they would probably go into a dead faint when they opened that final statement for the first time in 45 years. They'd have so much money in it they wouldn't believe it. And part part, part of that, of course, is an inflation effect. So uh, I, I I don't see that interday volatility 
and particularly conducted at a very low price, is a negative for passive investors. Now, there's some people that disagree with me, and I'm trying to get these people in touch uh, with, the, with, the, with the traders. Uh, people of Longleaf, who I respect very much, uh, have written the SEC a very detailed letter, so detailed and so long uh, that I honestly couldn't digest it. But uh, they're very concerned in, in the execution of their own transactions. But don't forget, the passive investor isn't doing transactions. So I honestly don't see the harm. I don't like it. It has some very bad effects, and, and, and one which I'll spend a lot of time on in the new book. I mean, there are two things that are really bad with all this turnover, I think, the main two things, uh, as long as it's done at low cost. And as my son, who's a hedge fund manager, as you know, Mark, may, may know, market neutral uh, and reasonably successful, uh, and, and he can beat the Treasury bill year after year pretty much every once, once in a while he doesn't. But uh, he said, how would you feel about all this trading? We're free if there were no frictional costs. And we've gotten to the point where the thing is almost free. Uh, there are almost no taxes. 70% of the stock is owned by institutions, endowment funds, pension funds, and half all mutual funds. Uh, assets are sort of tax deferred, uh, 401ks. And the other half, it is the mutual fund managers said they don't give a darn about how many taxes they inflict on you. They're not paid on after tax returns. So the taxes are really out of the frictional cost equation now. And commissions have come when I came into this business like 25 cents or 30 cents a share. Uh, and not just on 100 shares. But if you bought 100,000 shares, you'd pay 1,000 times as much. Uh, if you can imagine, no volume discount. And all this ended with negotiated commissions back in 1974. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the harm for the long-term investor, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to investigate and look and see if I'm right or not. I do try and keep an open mind. And uh, I, I try I spend a lot more time um, on the subjects that people disagree with me on than where people agree. Although that said, I have to say to Bill, who I'm, I'm, of whom I'm, I think, the captain of his, his uh, fan club, and there was an article, an uh, interview at, uh, at uh, Journal of Indexing, I guess a couple months back, uh, in, in which uh, Bill answered a bunch of questions other people do. And I couldn't find one single thing to disagree with. Uh, you know, we have disagreements, which we ought to talk about, uh, on uh, particularly on my forecast for future returns, which you mentioned yesterday. I want to spend a minute on that. But uh, there aren't any easy answers. And when you think about going back to the, the, the gravamen of the, of the question, uh, when you go back to defeasing or making sure your liabilities have the same time horizon as your asset, I think that's a great see uh, kind of thing. Uh, I think it's a great idea in a way, but it's, it, life is not that neat. You know, you say, well, I expect to live till 75 or 85, <laughs> let's say. I hope in my case, uh, at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so you defeat till age 85, and then you either died early or you're still alive. And so, and then we talk about, as Bill has talked about, college funding. You defeat to the, the college thing, that would work pretty well. And then, uh, you know, I think most people uh, want to leave their children something. Uh, well, that's a good idea. I'd leave to wiser heads than mine. Uh, but uh, so your, your defeasement period, defeasal period, is, uh, is very, very difficult to determine. And so, the, you know, even, even the global answers, the age based thing, is just an approximation, a rule of thumb. Uh, if you want to be high class, a heuristic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll throw just a, you know, a small bomb out, just a tiny bomb. Uh, which, which is that, you know, I, I've spent some time the past year or two thinking, thinking about tips. Uh, and they're, they're a fascinating asset class. And they became even more fascinating in 08, 09, uh, when they underwent just, a, you know, a, a, a larger decline in capital price than I think anybody had ever thought possible. I mean, long tips fell something like 25% uh, between, you know, the top and the bottom of the market in, in 08. And they're a fascinating asset class because they demonstrate that they're very risky in the short term, right? And yet they are absolutely riskless in real terms in the long term, all right? If you hold them until maturity. So they're only riskless when they're held until maturity. So they are the perfect asset class to the fees or to offset your liabilities at given stages. So that the ideal strategy, if you're going to offset your liabilities, your future liabilities with tips, is to buy a ladder 
five year ladder, you know, every, every one year intervals, whatever you want to do, it's quite possible to do. I think there's still a gap between 29 and 32, but you'll be able to do that soon enough. Maybe that's gone now with the, well, I don't know. But at any rate, it's, in principle, it's, it's, it's practical. So my suggestion uh, is that you should never invest in a TIPS fund, okay? Uh, for, for at least two reasons. Number one is you can generally buy TIPS cheaper even than the cheapest TIPS fund. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, you might need the money uh, at some point. And if you need the money at a point where uh, uh, TIPS are having the kinds of liquidity problems they had in 08, 09, uh, you know, your TIPS fund is going to have to take a haircut uh, if you're going to need that money out. So, you know, I think they're a fascinating asset class in any number of ways. I think the proper way to use them is not in a fund. Uh, but but in a ladder. Um, Jack, I want to ask you a question. Kathleen Ryan wrote in a comment and a question uh, in, in, about about you know whether you were born in 1929 and how that affected you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but but it raises another question in my mind, uh, which is that you know certainly the depression affected you, it affected me fairly directly as well. I mean, my parents grew up right in the middle of it. My father started his law practice in 1926, if you can imagine, small family law practice. So, uh, you know, I, I learned from my parents uh, about the Depression and what it mean, and a, an enormous amount of that rubbed off, on me, rubbed off on me as well. And then, you know, we, we entered this age of unbridled prosperity. People took on debt. The sky was the limit. And then in 08, 09, a lot of people found out uh, that it's not all beer and pizza. Uh, and, and so the question I have for you is that do you think anything fundamental changed about the temperament of investors uh, and of people in general uh, in 08 or 09? Yes, I do. And I, and I, I think it uh, is kind of the tragedy of American finance. And that is we can teach and teach and teach and teach and teach. But finally, people learn from their own experience. Uh, and. Uh, the great trick in life is to learn from the experience of others. <laughs> uh, not so easy to do. Uh, so I think they learn more about risk in the market. You know, we had this, this incredible consecutive decades of 17% stock returns. And people kind of, as they would say, a phrase I don't really use, have that baked into their expectations. That's absolutely absurd. And uh, this gets a little bit to, uh, eventually they're going to look at things, I believe, with the same kind of Bill will call it the Gordon model, very close to what I call the Bogle model, modestly enough, and uh, which is dividend yield plus earnings growth uh, plus or minus PE change is what determines returns. And that, that, that's not unpredictable, as I mentioned yesterday, over the long run. I, I want to quickly add, uh, however, because someone asked me about this, and I, I guess I failed to make it clear, which is pretty disgraceful on my part, and that is those were all nominal returns. So if you're looking at Three and a half percent for bonds and seven percent in stocks. You're looking at real returns. You know, I, I was sort of vaguely assuming. Now you don't have to assume anything to do those numbers. But you got to say what what's the inflation rate going to be? And I was vaguely assuming two or three percent. I don't think we can do much better than that. I think two percent looks like a better bet now, as you heard a little bit last night. Uh, you know, I was using three percent. So that gives you a nominal return on stocks of four percent uh, before before expenses. Um, before investor behavior, and uh, which we, as we all know, particularly in ETFs, there is between fund returns and investor returns, which I showed you yesterday. I just showed you the ETF side. The fund, the fund investors are subject to the same disease, but just in a milder form. And uh, you know, God knows what those people that went with uh, Bill Berkowitz at Fairholme, who's down 30 percent this year. That's a pretty handy drop uh, in a year where the market is, I guess, as of the close yesterday. Uh, S&P anyway is about, down about 2%. That's a 28% gap, mm -hmm. and those kind of things can happen. People pour their money into the winners. As, as Bill said, one of the things I was reading, um, <coughs> two words explain why the mistakes you made by following past performance. The first, the first word is Bill, and the second word is Miller. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so behavior is a big problem. Although, let me, let me just ask Bill about this. You know, we all talk about behavioral problems among investors. There are books written about it, uh, erudite scholarly books. That's the kind of thing I do, which shows your mutual fund behavior. But 
final analysis, Bill, why is behavior a problem? Because your bad behavior is inevitably offset by somebody else's good behavior. Yeah, no that's, way around it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the case. Uh, there, you know, for every winner, there is a loser. <laughs> and, you know, what I like to say is that investing is an operation in which wealth is transferred to people who have a plan and can stick to it from those who don't and can't. All right, and, and the people who let their behavior, I mean, my, my behavior, you know, you admit it yourself that you feel the same impulses, certainly so do I, and I imagine everybody else in this audience does, unless you suffer from severe Asperger's, probably does too. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and by the way, you know, I happen to believe that, that Asperger's, uh, mild Asperger's is probably a very, uh, it's, it's an enormous advantage uh, in any professional uh, uh, investor. If you read uh, Michael Lewis's book, The Big, Sh the Big Short, one of the people there who happened to be a unsuccessful neurologist, uh, <laughs> Jack knows, uh, was very successful exactly for that reason. He didn't feel other people's uh, emotions. So it's it's a continuum, uh, and you know Bill Sharp puts it another way. He describes convex and concave investors. You know people who follow momentum followers and uh, and rebalancers, and you know Bill believes that they're exactly balanced off in each other, but his central insight is that in a world that is dominated by momentum players, rebalancers, who are hopefully the kinds of people who are in this audience, will, will profit. Uh, and I think that it's fairly clear what world we live in. We live in a world that's dominated by emotional people who are following momentum. That's not to cast aspersions on people who, who, who graze the momentum factor, like your son, who do a very good job of it, but most people don't do it as well as your son does. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I happen to think the Bogle model is is greatly superior um, to the Gordon model, uh, which is one of the reasons why I come here every year. I know what the first two terms are before I get here, and so I wait with bated breath. And you tell me what the third term is, uh, which is you know the change in in PE. Uh, and God, God damn it, you've been right. Uh, <laughs> Would you mind repeating that? <laughs> Zero, and everybody gasped. I think it was, I don't know, 2000, 2002 or something like that, or 2003, uh, and everybody gasped. And you were, you were, of course, you were, of course, right. So yesterday, you came in and you said that it's minus one percent, uh, and it's a small quibble. I would, I would, I expected you to tell me that it was zero or even slightly positive. Uh, so why are you saying minus one percent? Why do you think the market is still overvalued? Well, the minus one percent, I think, was what I, what, what I, my formula would have shown for the, the decade beginning January 1, 2000, and ending December 30, 1, 1999. Uh, and the, the reason I think the market now may be a little bit overvalued is I do like the Schiller model. I know a lot of people do not. Ten-year average. Uh, I like two things about it, as I think I mentioned yesterday, but they're worth repeating. One, he uses reported earnings. After all, those bad things that corporations don't include in operating earnings, so they're much lower than operating earnings year after year after year, the tune of billions and tens of billions of dollars of earnings for the S&P companies. Now they're just plain overstated when you use operating earnings, but that's what we get. So uh, I like Schiller for, for using the correct earnings number. And then, you know, the, the market is full of, 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 of big events, short-term events. So 10 years seems like a more reasonable thing to do than looking at uh, the past year. And of course, to make matters worse, uh, so many people, Wall Street has this bullish bias, as everybody knows, and so they're looking at next year's earnings now, whatever they are. They have no idea what they are, uh, but they're going to be bigger than this year's, of course, because your job is to predict something good. And if you don't, as Merrill Lynch people have found, and maybe some, a lot of others, uh, the economists that forecast declining markets in the coming year lose their jobs. I mean, they really literally do. It's not popular to be a bear on Wall Street. So uh, Schiller gets over that by using it. Year thing and doesn't use doesn't use forecast, and I think his number says the average for uh, the last ten years is I think it's seventeen or eighteen times, and uh, I think we're around by 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 by, by where we are now. Uh, the the average I should say long term average is seventeen or eighteen times earnings, uh, and the and uh, right now I think it looks to me like we're around twenty or twenty one times earnings. Now that's not you, you can drive yourself nuts. That's as I probably got to yesterday. That's why I use a slide rule instead of a calculator to do these things. You know, they'll, they'll keep me from, from precision, where precision is not merit in anything that we do.
We just don't know about the future. One of the classic jokes about economists is, is, is to ask, how do you know that economists have a sense of humor? And the answer is because they use decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, my last sort of direct question to you is, is, is this. Uh, you know, you do, you do a lot of CNBC, Jack. Uh, and, and the question I have is, you know, there, there, you know, we all have print journalists, I think, who we respect a great deal. Uh, I think there's some people on radio, particularly at NPR, who are spectacularly good. Uh, but you also talk to a lot of people on TV, and you didn't have very nice things to say about them. Uh, and so the question is, is there anybody on television that you talk to who you have some respect for? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Jeff Kramer. <laughs> Closest would be Tyler Matson, who I've known for about uh, 20 years, more than 20 years. And uh, he wrote some great stuff in Money Magazine when he was an executive editor about uh, the triumph of indexing, it was called. He wrote that in, I think, 19, well, I know exactly when now that I think of it. He wrote that way back in uh, 1995, uh, when, before I was going into the hospital for a heart transplant. And he said in the last words, where you, you remember these sometimes, you were right, Jack. Indexing should be the core of all investors' portfolio. It's 1995, and the world has changed radically in favor of that proposition ever since. He also, getting back to the forecasting thing, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, after he, he interviewed me again after the heart transplant, which was about a year later, and uh, he, he, kind of, he said, uh, what did he say? Uh, he, some proof that I actually had a heart now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I had a change of heart, I guess is what I was going to be from here. This was in 1996, probably mid-year. I said, I don't know. You know, I thought about my little formula. And I said, probably between 7 and 9 percent over the next decade. And they turned out to be 8.3 percent. Uh, this is not a foolish exercise. Uh, and it's not always right. Uh, but you do know when PEs are high, they're apt to go down. We have low, as I mentioned yesterday, they're apt to go up. So uh, the one thing we don't, and I'll turn the tables a little bit on you, Bill, is, uh, and I should tell you a little inside story, I wanted to be briefed on Bill's book, and so I, I have one a signed copy, beautifully inscribed by Bill, quote, in my office, quote. So when I got back there between our sessions yesterday, I looked up to see how Bill dealt with Armageddon. Is there any way of dealing with Armageddon, really? Uh, and uh, Kevin had stolen my book. <laughs> he says he only borrowed it. <clears throat> but we, we retrieved it, but I still didn't have to look. So let, let me ask you, is there really, uh, I think we live in an extraordinarily fragile world. And we take for granted, pretty much, uh, because we're Americans, as Woodrow Wilson said, the only idealistic nation, na nation on Earth. Uh, we take for granted kind of a, a similarity to the future, to what it's like today, uh, in, in many, many ways. We don't really realize how much, for example, technology has changed the world, because we live with it every day, and each day changes a little bit. And when you get 10 years ago, uh, it's, it's different. And it says a lot of things about our economy, because uh, technology is only at the beginning, I think, uh, of, of its impact on us. That impacted me much, because I'm not smart enough. My grandchildren help me when I'm in trouble. Uh, and uh, so, is there a, really a way of dealing with Armageddon when we're at a stage in the world's history uh, that is, I think, remarkably different and remarkably more difficult uh, than we have had for a long time? Certainly different. Can goods and ammo. <laughs> but the, the answer, the, that, that translates down to no. Uh, there, there, there really is, is not. I mean, one of the joys of being a student of economic history uh, is that it enables you to look at what's happening in the financial markets and, ha and, 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 and place it in its historical context to, you know, hard to recognize bubbles. You can do, you can do a pretty good job. Hard to recognize real panics and appropriate panics, but again, you can be right most of the time. But the, the real uh, uh, frightening thing about uh, knowing some economic history uh, is that, that you also realize there are circumstances in which you are utterly helpless. If you were a citizen of Hungary uh, during the post-war period, or in Germany during the post-World War II period, or in Germany uh, during the early Weimar Republic, there was nothing you could do. 
or Zimbabwe more recently, there was nothing you could do about you know gazillion percent inflation. Uh, you know, bonds absolutely disappeared. I think the value of stocks in Weimar Germany declined by 99 percent, uh, and and that's there's just nothing you can do about it. And that's also why I believe that when you start working with these portfolio, these 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 Monte Carlo simulators, these retirement simulators that tell you that there's a 95% uh, survival rate uh, of your portfolio in, uh, in you know, in either 30 or 40 years of retirement. That's a fiction. There's no such thing as a 95% survival rate of any society over a 40 year period, because that implies a survival of a thousand years. That doesn't happen in history. Uh, and so, no, I mean, and the other answer I guess, and I, I, it's sort of a, mincing sort of thing to say is that sometimes as an author, particularly when you're not of Jack stature, you don't have as much control over the title of your book as you would like. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, I, I do know, I mean, you know, I thought you were going to say something about gold and uh, would be a kind of refuge, but I do know a very highly placed Wall Street or one of the veterans, one of the really best people in Wall Street's history. Uh, I'll remove all that by saying hey, this one happens not to be Paul Volcker. But he's really worried that the United States is going to go bankrupt. And he wants to do something in gold, and maybe he's already done it. He didn't quite make that clear to me. But he said he's worried about leaving it in the bank, because when the bank fails, he won't be able to get, <laughs> get his hands on it. <laughs> and that's, that's a, probably a good definition other than Hungary from, from Armageddon. And, and, and also, Bill, there, there are things in, in, your, in your wonderful work about uh, the birth of plenty uh, showing that the world went for from infinity to about, I guess the number is 1750 or something, without any measurable progress in the way it lived. And then we went into this era of steady growth, and for years and years, right up to today, and continuing certainly into the tomorrows, few tomorrows ahead at least, uh, is there any chance that that's going to change? Is that upscale uh, growth of the world economy uh, built into uh, built into the way we live today? Uh, and, and the other related question is, which I spent a little time on in my book, The Battle of the Soul of Capitalism, is the American empire looks in me, to me in many ways like the Roman empire. And at the very beginning of the book, I quote Gibbon, uh, what he said about the fall of the Roman empire at the beginning. And I just changed a half a dozen words and it sounded exactly like America, which is another, I have to tell you this funny story. And I said that to the Yale University Press. I said, no, I want that note of the original Gibbon's words on the same page as the footnote. And they said, at Yale University Press, footnotes are placed in the rear of the book. And I said, well, in that case, I guess I'll just have to find another publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so the footnote is right there where you can see it. And, and, but I do observe, and, and this, is, this is true, much as we don't want to pull the idea in our mind for very long, no empire has ever lasted forever. And, you know, that's life, that's history, uh, that's human nature. Um, a whole lot of reasons going to that. So, comment on those things, would you? Well, two questions. Number one is, you know, since 1820 approximately, per capita GDP uh, in the world has grown in a, in a real sense, in real terms, by about 2% per year, which basically means, you know, by the rule of 72, that on the average, uh, the life of the child is about twice as prosperous as the life parent. And I know that seems like a dubious proposition in this particular year in the past couple of years, but it's a function of technological advance, all right? And I don't think that the current economic difficulties that we have have slowed down technological advance one single bit. I'm reasonably optimistic, at least in the short term. But if you, you do the math, you know, 2% real growth over millennia leads to an impossible degree of wealth. You know, everybody worth a spear of gold at several light years in diameter. So, you know, we're in Terra Nova. I don't think that anyone knows the answer to that question since we've only been in this regime for the past 200 uh, years or so. Um, I, you know, the, the answer, the obvious answer seems to be that we'll, 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 under, we'll, we'll experience some catastrophe that will put a stop to that or at least level it out. Um, but interestingly, I, I did have the opportunity once to sit down at lunch with, with Bill Baumel. Uh, who's a very famous uh, economist and who's thought very deeply about these kinds of issues, particularly about the relationship between technology and growth. And he just smiled at me and said, of course we're going to become that wealthy, okay, because technology will continue to advance 
and there's not, you know, there's nothing that's going to stop that. So you can, at least one very smart person uh, who's thought of that very deeply has made the very, that, you know, has made exactly that case. Now, this Jack's second question, uh, you know, is, a, you know, relating the decay of, of our society to the decay of the Roman Empire. First of all, I think that our institutions are better than Rome's. Uh, certainly, we're not, we're going to lose our place uh, in the world as the leader of the world's economy. I mean, you know, in 1945, we produced half the world's industrial output, and it's been going down since. It's actually leveled off over the past couple of decades at around 20, or pretty close to 20%. It's not decreased that much uh, in, in, in percentage uh, terms, but eventually, you know, we have to get swapped um, by, by other developed countries, particularly those in Asia. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Our piece of the pie will still, the slice of the pie will, likely will increase, but we'll still have the actual size of the pie is going to increase. And the, the, the nation to think about is Britain. I mean, Britain went in 1900 uh, from ruling the waves, the world's greatest economic and military power, to, you know, right now it's basically an open air theme park with a nuclear deterrent. <laughs> and, 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 and yet, you know, would you rather be a, a citizen of the UK now or in the year 1900? Well, I, I shudder to think what it would be like to be an ordinary person in Britain in the UK in 1900. I mean, you had a society in which something like 20 to 25 percent of people uh, were so unemployed that they were in domestic service. All right, that's not the kind of society I want to live in. So I'm reasonably optimistic, I suppose. Well, I'm always optimistic, but I am I'm just, I, I try and think a little bit more about it, the hardships that may, we, we may endure out there. I worry terribly about uh, this unusual unemployment situation. It is unusual, much longer term unemployed, long term unemployed, and uh, that's over a year, say, and unemployment benefits running out, which we don't quite know what to do with all our fiscal problems come into this. So I'm a worrier. But uh, I'm still well aware of the fact that when anybody else in the face of this globe wants to get out of their own country, there's only one country they really want to go to. Uh, and uh, immigration has been a huge part of the American uh, ethic, the American history, the American, uh, I don't know, values, uh, American hope, American entrepreneurship, uh, all that kind of thing. And you see an awful lot of it still in, in small ways. You know, look around your town. And, you know, I used to think these were hardware stores that were selling nails. But it turns out they're another kind of nail thing. You're, still, you're starting out. And uh, so I see, still see the good side, but I do worry a lot about uh, whether our institutions, which are the best in the world, and our property rights are the best in the world. There's no question about that. And we have more stability than just about anybody else in the world. Uh, but you start to fracture uh, the society, uh, what's going on in, in whatever is Occupy Wall Street is, I think, not a trivial event. Uh, it's, it's sending a message out there, and uh, I worry most about whether, and I'd be interested in your comment on this, Bill, particularly, and as what I see really worries me about America, more than in a way anything else, is bigness. Mm. Corporations merge with each other, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and this includes Vanguard. Uh, you know, the, I mentioned yesterday that our market share was, I think, the biggest in, his, in, in, in mutual fund in industry history. 16, 17%, whatever it was, and it's not going to go down. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have the same kind of problems that typical big companies do. But they merge. They merge for accounting reasons. They merge for power reasons. They merge for compensation reasons. And uh, corporate America is a vital part of our nation's uh, progress. And yet, uh, you see the management's being, in many respects, corporate management being, in many respects, uh, divorced from the interest of their shareholders. And the shareholders, of course, I mentioned yesterday, and what I call the double agency society, and don't care because they're not direct shareholders. They've got their own agents, and the mutual fund agents aren't doing their job, and nothing is going to happen very good until we can restore some sense of fiduciary duty to our society. And I mentioned that yesterday, but I think that's absolutely crucial to resolve these problems. They're not going to resolve themselves. You know, there's, a, there's an old saying, which you're all familiar with, we get the government we deserve. Man, if that were ever true, it's true today. Uh, yeah, I'll answer that question as best I can until I see wave, until I see Mel waving frantically at me. Uh, uh, <laughs> basically, uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I mean, if, if I were to step back and say, what were the real risks that we face now? Uh, and it's always, you know, you never see the truck that's going to hit you. But the truck that I see that I think is going to hit us uh, is two things. One thing you've already mentioned 
which is that we have a system, a financial system, which is derivative based, which is lightning fast, is uh, extraordinarily complex and linked. Okay, and if you're a systems analyst, when you say, when you say, you know, complex and linked, uh, what that equals is Three Mile Island. Okay, you have a system that that can very quickly uh, spin out of control, uh, and I think what we saw in May uh, of of ten uh, with the flash crash was just the tiniest taste of what we could see if things go seriously and unexpectedly uh, haywire. Um, you know, the other thing is that we've. You know, the TARP, I think, was, a, was, was, was the right thing to do. Uh, I think that I, I shudder to think what would have happened if they hadn't bailed out the financial system. Um, but at the same time, uh, what do we have now? We have something that's even worse. We have, you know, instead of having N large banks, we now have N minus two large banks. Mm, yep. uh, and so too big to fail has gotten a whole lot worse. Um, I think the TARP was the right thing to do. I think that in retrospect, politically, the correct thing to have done would have been to send Elizabeth Warren out uh, mm -hmm. in late 2008, go to the banks and say, what part of we're bailing you out, don't you understand, and then seize the banks. Because they were insolvent, including Goldman. They were all insolvent. And that would have avoided the political problem that we have right now, uh, which are people who are angry at all the big bonuses and the fact that Wall Street is fatter and more profitable uh, than, than ever, we should have done to the whole system what we did to AIG. Jack, do you, do you, what do you think about that? No, I, I, I agree with you. The financial system is right at the root of all this. We treated them much too graciously. Uh, we, in this troubled asset repurchase program, I believe it's correct to say that no troubled asset has ever been repurchased. We're not with <laughs> the bank stock, gave the bank's capital, but aren't I correct? They're, we didn't buy any of those, no. those uh, mortgage bonds or collateral debt obligations from the banks. So TARP, I'm always amused when people uh, mention it. I'm also struck by the fact, uh, as you're all reading in today's and yesterday's papers, that we have a simple proposition. I wanted to have, bring back Glass-Steagall. I actually wrote about that in 2005, yeah. the uh, act that separated investment banking from deposit banking or commercial banking. And I said, bring back Glass-Steagall. And uh, that wasn't even going to be on the agenda. But we did get the Volcker rule that said banks could not essentially trade for their own accounts. Now, we're implementing that rule. And the implementation paper is 298 pages long. And there are probably six lobbyists in Washington per page. Mm -hmm. And uh, one can only imagine what comes out of this, mm -hmm. in, this uh, in this vague act that they're trying to put some meat in the bones on. And I'm not, I'm not optimistic that we'll achieve the objectives that Paul Volcker wanted. And he, he's pretty much the same way. He's very discouraged. I ran into him the other day. And I, I said, are you still going to Washington a lot, Paul? And he said, only when they need a photo op. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and let me, are we, are we getting toward the end? Yeah, could, could I have a couple, just to say a couple things? Uh, one, uh, it's always great to be with Bill. He brings a great intellectual stature, a great knowledge of history. Uh, his books, I commend every one of them to you from the, I guess the, the first book was The Four Pillars, was it? Uh, Intelligent Nationality. Oh, yeah. Intelligent Nationality. <laughs> Which was the one you wrote those nice things about me. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> That's a good place to begin. Uh, but uh, just being associated with Bill is, is the highlight of my life, honestly. And uh, I wish I did his writing talent, his historical grasp, but the Lord bestows his blessings unevenly. Uh, but I do want to say something. We've been talking about data, and I've shown you charts, and we're talking uh, economics. We're talking markets, uh, we're talking um, the financial system, things of that nature. And I think that what I've done in that area has been correct and good and helpful. And I do get letters almost every day. But I, I want to just close by saying that, that if, if I've ever been able to do anything, it's keep being who I grew up as. Uh, a friend of mine said to me the other day, you know, you're exactly the same kid I knew at Princeton. I took that as the highest compliment I've ever had. Uh, and part of that, therefore, which gives me some satisfaction, I'll never be fully satisfied with my career. I want to go back to the start with Bill's letter, the letter I wrote to Bill, and that is I've always liked to stay in touch with the actual investors who are here, you guys who are paying my compensation, and you guys are supporting my name and reputation. Uh, you guys are 
trusting Vanguard and trusting me too. Uh, and, you know, we can shake hands, we can look each other in the eye. And that part of uh, a big company is far more important to me than some number like 1.6 trillion, whereas 1.6 quintillion, I don't know. And, but I do want to close with two letters that will, be, will amuse you, because part of that practice I've had, just trying to treat people as individuals and not as part of great big groups, are two other letters which is thought about when Bill talked about the letter I wrote to him. They're really two amusing anecdotes, and it, uh, it's, it's so funny uh, that uh, uh, little things you do at the time, just because it's the right thing to do, come back to be very helpful to you. And uh, one of them, I got a letter from a Latino down in Florida, and uh, he wanted to know some fairly obscure investment question, and I'd never heard of him before. He wasn't anybody. Uh, and I wrote him a two-page answer to his question because it was the right thing to do. And he turned out to be Humberto Cruz, the, the financial editor of the Miami, one of the Miami, one of the, one of the uh, South, Fort Lauderdale, I guess, Times. And so he's always said nice things about me. That never really paid <laughs> off. <laughs> and even, even better, we had a, uh, a kind of catastrophic experience with my former employer uh, in the go-go era where we started a really stupid fund and gave it a stupid name uh, and uh, it was a very much an aggressive go-go fund and it blew up. It was called the originally called Trustees Equity Fund and of all the people it was not suitable for, it was trustees. But in any event, it was hot and came and went and was never heard of again. I got a letter from a doctor in Boston and uh, he said I had ruined his father's life. It was inexcusable. He was going to sue us. Uh, and in many respects, he was, he was actually right. He was a disgrace. Uh, his father was retired now in Arizona. And when I wrote him a two-page letter, which he has never forgotten, how do I know he's never forgotten it? He turned out to be the cardiologist that recommended I get a heart transplant. <laughs>